Our guest this week is a Anderson County native, basically, who grew up here, went to BHP, and then became a world-renowned baseball player. <laughs> Matthew Lee Croy is our guest. Talk a little bit about BHP and, and your tenure there. Well, uh, you know, I, I uh, was a part of a state championship baseball team as a freshman. Had they had him before? They had one the year before I, when I was in the eighth grade. Is that the two they've only had? That, no, they've had five total. That have was, they that really? That was the first two. And then uh, I actually won a state championship in tennis in my junior year. Played football. You know, we were in a, a really tough conference. But, you know, uh, I had an enjoyable time. I was student body president. Uh, you know, I just enjoyed all my teachers. The principals were great. A lot of support. And then... As my uh, high school career came to an end, I was able to go to Clemson, and then uh, and Jack Leggett. Jack Leggett was my coach. He recruited me, but then I was drafted in the second round by the New York Mets as a senior. So I had a decision to make. So Jack actually gave me a full scholarship to stay, which made I mean it was that was an unbelievable accomplishment and reward for all the hard work, and I ended up going to Clemson. How difficult was it for you and your family to make that decision not to accept the Met job and go to Clemson? Well, I'll tell you what happened. They, they flew me to Florida for 48 hours. The big league team was on strike. Usually they'll send you to the major league stadium. Well, unfortunately for them, they didn't. They had to send me to Florida. And it was just, I just didn't feel right about starting it. I was young. I wanted to experience college. And it gave me an opportunity to play for the Olympics and play on some really good teams there at Clemson. And it was the right decision. I grew up a lot. My body changed. Uh, more discipline. Had to do my schoolwork and sports at the same time. So I think it helped me become, uh, it reached my ultimate goal of becoming a major leaguer. And tell me about playing for Jack and Clemson. What, what was, what was the, your record at Clemson? What well, we were number one in the country for two straight years, almost the whole season for both, both years. And unfortunately, we didn't win in the World Series. But uh, he was good. He was a hard worker. We had some really good, talented players that uh, got along really well. Our chemistry was was off the charts, and uh, you know it, it taught me a lot about uh, team, the team aspect of it, and how to work together to try to accomplish something. And that that helped me when I got into pro ball to to be the leader, to to be the guy that kind of gels everybody mm -hmm. together to hopefully win a World Series. As a junior, I was drafted in the first round by the Twins, Minnesota. So I ended up I held out all summer, got my bonus, and then I took off and. Started my journey in the pro ball, spent two years in the minor leagues before I made it, which was, was relatively quick. Tell me about the two years in the minor leagues. We hear horror it, stories about what those guys go through. Is it as bad as we hear? Not really. I, I, I kind of moved up fairly quickly. The lower level, the A ball, the rookie ball, that's, it's a tough, it's a tough uh, grind. But when you get to double A, especially when you get to triple A, you start flying a little bit, so it's not as bad. But there's nothing like playing in the big leagues. They wind and dine you. They take care of you. It's a total different lifestyle uh, when you're playing up there. And, and it's why everybody wants to make it. But just yeah. not necessarily the money, but the way people treat you and, and you're playing against the best people in the world. I had two back-to-back -back really, really good years. And then my second year, the GM came in and watched us play in AAA, Terry Ryan. And where are you now playing I was, AAA? I was in Salt Lake City, Utah. Really? And just... Tremendous year, and he basically told me, you're going up after the playoffs. We were in the playoffs in the minor leagues. In the first game of the playoffs, I broke my finger. <laughs> so I had to wait. So I spent all off season trying to heal up, getting ready for spring training. And then the following spring, I made the club out of, out of spring training. So the year would have been? That would have been 2000. 19 years ago, you make the big leagues. Yep. Did you sleep the night you knew you had made it? Well, to be honest with you, I didn't really, you know, it wasn't like normal where they call you in and go, hey, man, you, you go, we're going to the big leagues. It was basically they called me in right after the workout in Minneapolis and told me to sign my contract because they had to add me to the roster. And, you, know, I, you know, I was obviously excited. And that night before, I didn't, you know, I didn't sleep. You know, it, my family was there and, you know, I just got married and, and uh, everybody was there to watch my first game. At this point, do you have an agent? Yeah, I had a. I still do. Scott Boris, he's the the big time agent. I okay. knew him when I was in high school. That's who you wanted. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, there's not much he can do for you the first couple of years you're playing. It's just in the minors, you mean? Not really. I mean, okay. they, they can, they give you initial contract, 
they try to negotiate that. And then once you get in the pro ball, it's, it's up to you to put the numbers up. And then when you get past your third year of service in the big leagues is when he can start getting more involved with your, with the contract. And then that helps. Yeah, it helps. He's kind of the, you know, he's the negotiator for you and you don't really have to deal with all the negative things that, that they're going to say about you to try to get your money down. Once you made the big time and you get out of spring training, mm -hmm. give me an idea of what a, a normal day is like for you in the majors. You got a night game. Okay. And, and you, you're based in Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. So say you're flying to play somewhere else. What's the day like? Okay, so what we do is uh, if it's a 7 o'clock game, you get in at about 1 or 2 o'clock maybe early, take early batting practice. Now, early batting practice is not the batting practice that the fans see when they come to a game. So if you need to work on anything, they do machines, all that kind of stuff on the field. And then at four for a home game, we usually go stretch, take batting practice, do ground balls. This is where the fans are watching. This is when the fans can come into the game. And then we go back in, we have a meal uh, that we can, you know, we eat before the game. And then you go back out 20 minutes before the game, get get heated back up, play. After the game, you usually have a workout, and they feed you. And then if we're going to, say we're going to Anaheim or New York, we'll go to the private terminal. You get in there, they take your bags. You fly into New York, wherever you're going. Your bags are in your room when you get there, which I never could quite figure out how they did that. But uh, it, was, it was awesome. You know, the way they treat you, the... Uh, the professionalism, it, it's, it's quite remarkable. If you have a home game at night, then you fly out that night. That to, night. And so 2, 3, 4 in the morning, mm -hmm. you arrive at your destination, sleep until when the next day if you have another well, game? Well, if we get in real early, we get in like at 4 or 5 in the morning, we usually have what's called a show and go. You just show up, stretch, and play. We don't do any pregame really? activities. But most of the time, you'd get in before midnight, you know, we – we uh, would have our normal come in. We have a bus at three. Go take your, you know, all your stretching, pick the yeah. fee, and then play the game. That first year, is there a game that you remember where you really did well, and and you were at the end of the day, you said, "Boy, this is what I dreamed of all my well, life." Well, I thought my first game, uh, you know, getting my first hit, my first at bat. Who was the pitcher? It was Steve Traxel for the. Tampa Bay, and what was neat about it was my childhood idol growing up was Jose Canseco, and he was actually on the team. So it kind was, of was he really? Kind of was very surreal. You know, yeah. he was the first car, baseball card that I ever purchased at the jockey lot. Was it really? Oh yeah, I still got. You remember it. what you paid for it? Four bucks, <laughs> which was a lot back then, you know. But uh, and I told him that when he came up to hit, you know, I said, "Hey, I want you to know that you were my childhood idol." He told me to hush because it's making him feel old. But it was. Uh, just that experience, that game, and and uh, but I really struggled my first year. I had to go back to the minor leagues. Uh, I had some good days and some bad days, but uh, I went down, had to do some more work, which I you know I knew I had to do, and then I spent the whole off season trying to revamp what I my swing, and then the next year I I did a lot better, and then then it uh, everything came together. Does that become a mental thing, or is it all mechanic? Most of it's mental. When you when you really struggle, the the mental side of it is what usually keeps people in a rut. Fortunately for me, you know, going to college, having a brother that picked on me, and you know, <laughs> you know, I dealt with a lot of stuff from him that to make me make me tougher, and all that helped me to to get out of it. Most of the guys I played with in the minor leagues, they couldn't handle what I went through, but I think. Me going through everything I went through as a child and in college and high school, it really helped me to, to get through it. And I was able to make that adjustment to stay up there. I probably had a good mix between catcher and, and designated hitter. As I got older, couldn't squat as well anymore. They moved me to first because I was more of an offensive guy. My best year, I hit 287, had 17 home runs and 64 RBI. So I had two back-to-back Really, really good season. I never really got to play every day, but I was on some tremendous teams that and got to play in some big games and and, and the history of you know Minnesota and yeah. really happy that they they drafted me when they drafted me.
I leave Minnesota. And I signed a contract with the Washington Nationals. The year would have been? 2006. And then I played pretty much the whole year in Washington. And then the next year I became a free agent again. I signed a minor league contract to go back to Minnesota. So I ended up I had to go to the minor leagues and then I made it back to the big leagues. And I knew I was getting getting close to not you know, having a job anymore and knew that I wanted to stay in the game. So I thought about coaching. I had already talked to other coaches about it. And then in 2008, I, I, I went to Oakland A's spring training, didn't make the club. I played independent ball for a year. And then the day I retired, or you know, told my agent I wasn't playing anymore. The Washington Nationals called me to manage one of their A-ball teams in Hagerstown, Maryland. So in 2009 is when I started my coaching debut, managing. So I coached from Hagerstown for two years, which is our low A-ball team. And then in 2011, I managed our high A team, which was in Woodbridge, Virginia. And then in 12 and 13, I managed our double A team. And then after the 13th season, I was uh, hired to be the bullpen coach in the big leagues for two years. So 14, 2014 and 15, I, I was the bullpen coach for our big league team. And then the, I got reassigned to go back to double-A to manage. And then I was there from 16 to 19. And then this coming 20, I got a new job. I'm on Rove. I'm going to go oversee all of our minor league teams. Uh, You're an administrator? Uh, not really an administrator. I'm just... I get to go and you know make sure everybody's on track and doing what we're doing and uh, the programs that we have set for everybody. So it, it gives me an opportunity to come home. I'll work for a couple of weeks, come home for a couple of weeks, which I hadn't been able to do for a long time. What's remarkable about the whole process is when I got the job in 2009, we probably were the worst organization in all of baseball. And then we hired Mike Rizzo to become our general manager, who's the general manager now. And he hired new scouts. We had tremendous drafts. Uh, our minor league player development was, was probably second to none. And then to see it all come together, uh, the guys that we were developing, the guys from, that we brought in as free agents, we kept getting closer and closer. And then we made it to the playoffs in 12, mm -hmm. lost. And then when I was up there in 14, we made it and lost to San Francisco, who won the World Series yeah. that year. And then we came close in 16 and winning that first round we lost. And so everybody doubted that we could win. And then this year was just incredible. You know, I had probably during that season this year, I probably had 12 or 13 kids that I've managed throughout. And it was just an awesome honor to see these kids. Like and, a proud papa. Yeah, you? I mean, you see them as babies and then you see them develop and, and the stuff you put them through yeah. to make them tougher and to deal with all this stuff and then to watch it unfold. And, be the last team standing is, was tremendous. And they made us feel like we were, we were there. I mean, they flew us up there. and Just a, just an awesome opportunity. You know, I always dreamed of winning a World Series, yeah. and, and uh, I'm looking forward to displaying that ring somewhere. You know, I always think about when I made it to the big leagues, how awesome it was. Yeah. But when I look back and realize the work that I was had to put into it, the sacrifice, uh, the support from family, and, you know, my friends, the church, everybody who prayed for me, all that stuff that 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 went into this. That's what makes it even more special yeah. to see it, you know, unfold and and uh, everything seems to be going good. So I researched how many baseball players that played in the big leagues for, were from Belton, and it was a guy named Leroy Mahaffey. And one of my coaches that I played with, he collects baseball cards, so. I wanted a Leroy Mahaffey card. He played in the 20s, it was like 23 to 26 or 27. And he sent me that Leroy Did Mahaffey really? tobacco card, which I thought was pretty neat. And that, growing up as a child, and then when I got into pro ball, I used to hear people when we, I'd go eat with my papa at Roosters down here yep. in downtown, people would talk about Leroy Mahaffey. So I thought it was, you know, I'm gonna get a card. Yeah. Or try to get one, which uh, he had it. Fortunately, he sent it to me. Yeah. So it's pretty neat. It's it's funny, man. You don't you don't realize how hard it is to make it to the big leagues, and uh, the percentage is very. I, I put it in perspective. We draft forty players every year from a draft. Plus, we have probably fifteen Latin right. signees. So right. fifty-five to sixty players that we sign every year, and it's actually a good year if two or three actually make it out of each draft. 
And wow. making it is not actually staying. It's just yeah. actually make it to the big leagues. So yeah. it's you got to have a lot of luck, and you got to have some skill that allow you to to make it. Okay, how did you end up at Central and, and Williamston speaking up there? The associate pastor, the youth pastor there, uh, Joe, um, he has a ministry, and he takes a group up north to Baltimore, and uh, he's from that area, and they have a sponsorship with the church. Well, he always feeds my team. So uh, I developed a, a relationship with him, and then this off season when I got back, he somebody uh, wanted to know if I'd come and share my testimony yeah. to their church there and um, it was pretty good you know it was a I thought it was just a men's group but it was everybody everybody there at the church and uh, I just shared with them my life growing up about how much uh, you know I was I was blessed to have wonderful parents that that told me no and and made me work didn't allow me to quit when I started something and but more importantly they told me about Jesus and how important it is to yeah. have him number one in my life and I told them stories growing up, being the fat kid that, you know, I prayed all the time that the Lord let me grow, you know, and I always dreamed about playing in the big leagues. And I told a story about the time my daddy sat me down when I told him I wanted to play in the eighth grade. I want to be a, a college baseball player. And he wrote these ridiculous things down for me to do every day. And uh, I don't think he believed I could would do it. And I actually did it. And like I, what? Well, I'd hit 500 balls every day before I went to school. I'd do running and sit-ups and push-ups and all that. And all of a sudden, I think my prayer started working. I started getting taller and, and uh, leaned up a little bit. And uh, I told a story about, you know, being the probably the weakest kid in that school as a going to my summer workouts to, to my freshman year. Yeah. Now, my first day of back at school and as a freshman, I was benching a lot a lot of weight and so it was just shared my life story growing up and and the moments and how much God was the, is the only reason I was able to accomplish it you know what was unique about me growing up here is it's small everybody you know they saw me grow up yep. and all my friends and then when I got to high school then you added another community honey path yep. I didn't grow up in honey path but I had a lot of support from from a lot of my teammates and parents that that live in Honey Path, and uh, so it's actually two communities that yeah. that, that really supported me. And it was I, I think uh, I don't I don't believe I'd want to live in anything bigger than Belton. You know, it's what I'm familiar with, and I wanted my kids to grow up the way I grew up, and it's just a good place to live. And the, the job that you've had now, you, tell me the schedule on a yearly basis that allows you to be home for most holidays. Well, you know, my baseball season starts usually in the middle of February for spring training. That's a 50-day uh, uh, part of my schedule. And then the season starts in the minor leagues the first week of April. And then that goes to all the way to September if you make the playoffs. It goes mid-September, yeah. and then you get to come home. You start your off season. And then uh, I don't have to go back to February. Well, with this new job that, I, that I've got, it's similar. But once April comes, then I work for two weeks, and then I come home for two weeks. So, it's not bad, is it? Yeah, my wife won't have to cut the grass no more, so she, she's excited <laughs> about that. <laughs> Matthew Lee Croy has been our guest, a great Andersonian from Anderson County and from Belton. For his entire time, ever since I've known you when you were playing at BHP, you've done your community and your state proud and the fact that you give credit where credit is due and your dad and Jesus and the whole nine mm -hmm. yards. It's, it's been a good ride, hasn't it? It sure has. I've been, I've been so blessed in so many ways. We want to thank Matthew and we want to thank each of you for tuning in and invite you to be back with us next week, same time for our next edition of Conversations with Paul Brown. Until then, take care, everybody.